My name is Brent Lane. I'm at the University of North Carolina Business School. I uh, run a, a research center at the Keenan Institute of Private Enterprise, named for Frank Hawkins Keenan from the Keenan family, one of the I think one of the prominent family of industrialists and economic leaders and political leaders in education. So I'm pleased to represent them here today and talk about the history of collaboration between small investors in supporting economic growth in North Carolina, something that we now call crowdfunding, but has its roots, very deep roots, here in North Carolina in ways that shape our character in the past and today. I began my career as a, as a venture capitalist here in North Carolina, investing in startup companies around the state, innovative entrepreneurial companies, back when we didn't even use the term entrepreneur that much. In fact, one of the things that I, I find interesting is how entrepreneurs has consumed many very useful terms we used to use in business. Um, but we invested in entrepreneurs and I learned a great deal about what can be achieved and what the challenges involved in starting and growing successful companies are and how important the role of investors is in that, not only large institutional organized investors, but small investors, what we call angel investors. Well, that's what crowdfunding is intended to do. As we use the term today, crowdfunding is the ability for small investors to pool their money to invest in enterprises. Uh, there are a number of, uh, of federal and state level securities laws that have, in the purpose of protecting small investors, in many ways impeded that type of activity. And there has been legislation passed at the federal and now at the state level that is intended to facilitate the ability of individuals to invest in businesses in their communities and elsewhere. Well, that's what crowdfunding is as we use it today. But I'm going to speak about crowdfunding and the role it's played in North Carolina and how for us it's, it's not a new idea. In fact, it is in many ways part of our economic DNA. I spend quite a bit of my time working with policymakers here in Raleigh, legislature in particular, on economic development issues. I've worked with uh, members of the legislature and legislative committees on, on evaluating ec economic incentives, on setting goals in economic development very involved in the, the successful tax reform effort of a couple of years ago and involved in some ongoing work now on refining our economic development efforts. But we should often, more often ask ourselves, what are we trying to accomplish in economic development? Because too often it's, we see it as, as it is very often practiced, a form of crony capitalism, a, dis, a market distortion by public actors. But there is another role for economic development, a non-governmental role, and it is one that enables communities to have some ability to both influence their economic future and to participate and benefit from it. And the most successful economic development period in North Carolina history is an example of that form of economic development. I tell every audience I talk to, we need to know and recognize, if we're talking about the economy, we're talking about economic development, North Carolina is a big economy. If you want to have results in North Carolina, you have to move a big economy. We are the, by, by international measures, the 28th largest economy in the world and the 10th in the U.S. It's a big state, a big economy, yet at the same time it's a state of many small places. But in economic development, if we want to have an effect if the decisions folks make in Raleigh on use of incentives and other things that are the tools of conventional economic development, it is hard to move the needle in North Carolina. And that's why quite often we can be extremely successful in what is called economic development, and perhaps have really little effect on the economic well-being of our citizens. And an illustration of this is that by the measures of economic development, that group of participants who, uh, who work on, uh, on city and regional planning, they sculpt uh, economic incentive packages, they are site consultants for large companies looking to locate. North Carolina's had an outstanding couple of decades. Site Selection Magazine, which represents the, uh, the site consulting class who helps companies find where to locate. By their standards, North Carolina is an extraordinarily successful business climate. 15 out of 20 years, we've been number one. But I look at the economy through a different lens. I've worked in economic development. I spent a total of over 10 years within the North Carolina Department of Commerce. But in the last 12 years working at the University of North Carolina Keenan Flagler Business School, uh, I've been working with folks in the economy across North Carolina. And there's a different way to look at how our economy is performing that I focus on. And it's not through 
the economic development glasses. It's through the magnifying lens of income. How are we doing on income? And based on income, North Carolina is 39th in the nation in our per capita income compared to our national peers. Now, per capita income, it's important to note, includes all income. It's not just your wages. It's not your salary. It's every form of income you might receive. So right now, we are where well, we're a little bump up from 84.7, but we've lagged behind the U.S. for most of our economic history. And most importantly, in those 20 years where we were number one, 15 out of 20 years in business climate for economic development, we actually saw our per capita income fall further and further behind the rest of the countries. So as we were celebrating economic development success under several governors, under different political ideologies, we lost sight of something. And that was, regardless of how successful we were in recruiting industry, our citizens' economic well-being was in decline. We fell from a high point of our income compared to the U.S. from being 93% of the U.S. down to now 85%. So that's an important decline. It's, it's something we were obscuring because we were looking at economic development rather than economic well-being. It amounts to a, an annual loss of $30 billion in annual income, and it really puts us back to where we were in per capita income back in 1984. So what's crowdfunding going to do about this? Crowdfunding is just one of several economic development initiatives that have been, uh, been proposed in the last few years within the legislature. And crowdfunding speaks to what I mentioned before. It is intended to facilitate the way people can participate as investors in their economy, in local entrepreneurs, or in entrepreneurship in general. And in that sense, it's a very positive development. Now, in North Carolina, we have looked to crowdfunding in the past when we were in economic doldrums. Some of you may be familiar with the period in the early 19th century where North Carolina was known as the Rip Van Winkle State. We had so many limited ec economic opportunities that much of our population left to go elsewhere. And it was in the midst of this period, one of my favorite political leaders in North Carolina's history, and I do tend to look at North Carolina history for inspiration and edification. One of my favorite leaders in North Carolina history is a, a representative from Rowan County called Charles Fisher. As he was the head of an economic development study committee at the legislature. Now, they did have them back in 1828. And in this case, they were looking at how North Carolina could revitalize its economy, or at that point, revitalize it, wasn't re yet. <laughs> Vitalize the economy by investing in manufacturing. And there was a recognition, even before the Civil War, the effects it had, that in North Carolina, we didn't have much wealth. We didn't have wealthy industrious, wealthy families that could invest in grand new enterprise. But we did have the ability, if we could collectively work together, to pool our money and have the effect that could be accomplished by the union of many persons. Now, this was good advice and recognizes the necessity of time. And you, this, is, this is essentially the manifesto of crowdfunding. And then that, that, that good effort was, inter, was, was interrupted by the Civil War and the period of Reconstruction. And post-Reconstruction, there was a recognition amongst the leadership and, and citizens across the state that North Carolina's economic well-being was entirely within its own hands. There was going to be no federal response. Reconstruction was not going to rebuild the economy. It would be up to the citizens of the state themselves to pull the state up out of the mire through their own bootstrap efforts. And that began a campaign that developed very quickly. You could think of it as a civic movement, almost a religious movement, to build mills to industrialize the state economy. The state, which had previously been primarily agri agricultural, recognized coming out of the, of the Civil War that much of the raw materials of the state had historically been shipped out of state for processing, and then we would buy those things back from others. There was a recognition that that needed to be reversed, and it was a tremendously successful period of industrialization. And by that I mean not only did they build industry in the state, it was sustainable industry, an industry that created what we think of, now we look through the mirror to the past, of the old industry set of North Carolina, tobacco and textiles and furniture. But those were the new industries of the mid-19th uh, mid century. So this represented the first entrepreneurial era in North Carolina. I was talking with, with David Stover a few minutes ago. He and I used to work together at the Department of Commerce back in the 80s when the term entrepreneur was a new idea. 
It was a new term. It was not a new idea. North Carolina has, has its own distinguished heritage of entrepreneurship, and entrepreneurship rooted in some of the factors that create the greatest economic impact, using local skills, local management, local raw materials, turning them into value-added goods, selling them outside the borders of the state, and then re recruiting that profit back into North Carolina. That's how we build wealth. That's how we build income. That's how we build jobs. What is a mill? This is a little bit for my folks at UNC. A mill is a factory. This is a mill from, I think, Lord of the Rings. I think this is a hobbit mill. Uh, this is not a mill. This is a mill. This is a 19th century mill. Now, this immediately evokes a lot of response in Chapel Hill about the terrible working conditions in the mills of the South, the use of child labor in the South. Well, these are actually mills in Lowell, Massachusetts. <laughs> but they are representative of the sort of environment and the sort of technology and machinery and the physical uh, structure of what a mill meant in the 19th century. There's another hero of mine, some of you may be familiar with him, who's from NC State. Good. There's a building at NC State, I'll show it to you. Daniel Augustus Tompkins was one of several civic-minded business leaders in North Carolina who helped lead the effort to industrialize North Carolina after the Civil War. He particularly focused on the cotton mill campaign. The, with, you know, the rallying cry was exactly about bring, take the raw materials we have and produce the finished goods here, bring the mills to the field. He wrote not just the book on industrialization of the South, he wrote the two books on industrialization of the South, on cotton mill uh, commercial features and on how to raise money. Uh, now, Mr. Tompkins was originally from South Carolina, but he, was, he, he moved to North Carolina and became quite prominent as a salesman of machinery for the textile industry. So he had not only a, a philanthropic and civic spirit mindedness to him, he also recognized the private enterprise opportunity before them. If we could build more mills, we could sell more mill machinery, and that, in fact, that was, the, that was the, the cluster that we could develop, all the inputs and the final products and the production function itself. So he distilled down, this is Tompkin Halls at NC State, by the way. Note the date on this. Almost everything I'm going to be talking about happens between 1880 and 1910. This is a period, just three decades, of a tremendous revolution in North Carolina, and not just North Carolina, South Carolina, other parts of the South as well. But this is Tompkins Hall. Now, my wife is an NC State grad. I think she's familiar with this. This was designed as literally a textile mill on the campus and became the centerpiece of what was the beginnings of North Carolina State University, a cause for which Tompkins was also a champion. Now, I've done a lot of work writing term sheets for investment. Now, term sheets is simply what the investors say they're going to offer to the entrepreneur in exchange for their capital. Tompkins came up with a very simple model that was designed specifically for the environment he was in, which is not a lot of wealthy people. Most of the capital was in the hands of small investors. If you wanted to attract and pool capital, you had to enable small investors to pool their money, crowdfunding. And he designed a, 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 a prospectus that would enable communities to pool their money and build a profitable scale mill, textile mill in this case, for $100,000, a little less than $3 million today. And they would sell 1,000 shares of $100 each to finance it, and you would invest in it with 50 cents a week. This was the mechanism that enabled thousands of North Carolinians to become capitalists and invest not only in a private enterprise, but an enterprise that was rooted within their communities. Look at the heart of every small town in North Carolina. There's a mill built between 1880 and 1910 at the heart of those communities. And that, those are, to me, tremendously important structures in the history of North Carolina. Now, I also recognize this from investment, is that you don't build a mill right away. You have a four-year rollout. This is the sort of thing we teach at the business school at Chapel Hill right now in entrepreneurship. This is fairly standard. How much money do you need? How long is it going to take to deploy it? How profitable will it be? And in the case of these mills, they were looking at cash flows of 10 to 30%. Not tremendously profitable, but profitable, and, and particularly profitable in ways that was widely shared throughout the community. Now, they were not speculating on some risky new concepts. These, tech, not, these textile mills were not startups in a brand new industry. North Carolina had had considerable success 
although limited in scale, in the text of the I'm going to run through a few examples that I think demonstrate something that I'm particularly adamant about. And that is in North Carolina, innovation is not a new idea. Innovation is part of our DNA. And it's not an RTP phenomenon. It is something we have practiced throughout the state. Entrepreneurship is something that's part of our DNA and is exemplified. This is the first textile mill in North Carolina. It's in Lincoln County, which, by the way, is also where the pharmaceutical industry began in North Carolina because during the Civil War it was converted to an opium poppy processing facility to produce opium. So you have the first the beginnings not only of the textile industry but of the pharmaceutical industry. Alamance Platt in Alamance County produced the first global textile brand in North Carolina. Most of our production of textiles was fairly generic commodity goods, but they produced a specifically branded gingham plaid in consultation with a French designer out of the Burlington area and produced the first globally branded North Carolina textile product. Heckler Mill in High Point was the first steam-powered textile mill in North Carolina. Now, steam was the sexy new enabling technology of the time. It was the, it was the new energy source of the period. And our textile industry was also early adopters of electricity when it became available. And, and other breakthroughs like air conditioning were first adopted within the textile industry. And then one of my favorite examples was it comes so close to home. The building I work in is the Keenan Center. It's named for John Moore, John, uh, John Motley Moorhead. <laughs> I'm about to get it wrong. But John Keenan uh, made most of his money as a young employee at a company that started based on an innovation that occurred in the Moorhead Textile Plant up in, in uh, Rockingham County, where they accidentally, in the process of experimenting with the smelting of aluminum, accidentally in invented the process to make calcium carbide, which could produce acetylene gas, which became the basis for a whole new chemical industry. So the roots of the chemical industry in North Carolina come out of our textile industry and out of one of those very successful rural locations in North Carolina. So you had a campaign to mobilize capital, broadly spread across the state, and it was tremendously successful. The number of mills exploded by the hundreds, employments by the thousands, all the, all the time, while we think of the industry in North Carolina as often coming from somewhere else, the textile industry was 90% owned in state. This was an indigenous entrepreneurial phenomenon. In, tw in 1925, we passed Massachusetts to become the largest textile producer in the, in the, in the country. We peaked in employment in, tw in 1996, you know, almost a quarter million employees, and now we're down to 35. So I guess I can excuse folks who look at the textile industry in North Carolina as a failure. And I can only say, if you've got an industry that will only last for 100 years, like the textile industry in North Carolina, we would love to hear more about it. The fact that that industry has declined in employment is also a reflection of its investment in, in productivity. We still have a vital textile industry in North Carolina. It simply doesn't employ people the way it used to. But it was certainly a stalwart of our state economy based on local capital, local entrepreneurs, local input for global customers. So right here in Raleigh, Right here in Raleigh, you got three prime examples of that textile mill phenomenon. You don't have to go far to see them. You got the Carolee Mills, Pilot Mills, and say so Carolee's that way, Pilot's that way, and the Raleigh Cotton Mills that way. They're all of them within about two miles of where we are, and every one of those built in that same narrow window, built by local investors here in Raleigh. So even Raleigh was an industrial center in the textile industry as a result of crowdfunding. So. The thing that makes these particular developments so significant, and it's less important when we look at economic development in a big old state, is that the effect of this economic phenomenon had statewide possibilities. We have some other industries that have been tremendously successful that we've developed in the last few years. The biotech industry is, by almost any measure, tremendously successful, but it is concentrated geographically. This was a phenomenon that had a statewide uh, function. It was value added. When I talk with audiences ranging from freshmen at UNC to legislators here in Raleigh, and I talk about value added production for export markets, I don't talk about the iPhone. I talk about pickles. North Carolina is also the pickle capital of the world, down near Mount Olive, and it's as simple as this. What's the difference between the value of a cucumber and what's the price of a pickle? That's the value added component. We did the same thing, and it's important that we continue to do so in our manufacturing, and especially when we use local materials and local suppliers. In the case of pickles, we use the local cucumbers, 
an industry, a pickle industry that developed in North Carolina simply because the, the pickler in New Jersey refused to take any more cucumbers from North Carolina. So they said, we'll pickle our own cucumbers. Thank you very much. And in our, particularly our work with economic development with the legislature, it's, it, it, it's very clear that the most important characteristic is that you employ your existing workforce. This is how we create wealth in North Carolina, not by recruiting companies to move their employees from somewhere else here, but to, to build industry that employs our existing residents. And most especially, this is what really distinguishes crowdfunding emphasis from traditional economic development, where we usually talk about jobs and income, is we need to create local wealth by involving local investors who, who, who benefit from and distribute the profits made. Those were the characteristics of that cotton mill campaign era. It drove manufacturing growth from North Carolina, the doldrums of the Rip Van Winkle era. Its entrepreneurial nature led to, to long-term wealth creation. And in very important ways, it made us who we are today. North Carolina is a different state than any other state. Now, John's got a good, John Hood's got a good piece today about North Carolina's exceptionalism. In many ways, it's not. But in one way it is, is that North Carolina, for almost 100 years, was simultaneously the most rural state in the U.S., in terms of percent of people outside of the cities, and the most industrialized percent of employment in manufacturing. And that cemented in place the economic and demographic structure we have today, which has created much of the political discussion that you're hearing about the rural divide and some of the other challenges and issues we have. So, in our case, population centers developed around industry rather than industry around population centers. This is the location of textile mills in North Carolina in 1896. Now the size of the dot reflects how many mills are there, but you see it's a statewide phenomenon. With a few exceptions in the far west and the far east, textile mills drew, grew throughout North Carolina, and where they grew, cities followed. Cities followed the industrialization. North Carolina's investors, pooling capital using the crowdfunding techniques of the era, built the demography of North Carolina. Still today, we have a collection of disparate metro areas and a term some people aren't familiar with, micropolitans. Micropolitans are essentially market towns of 15,000 or fewer who are separate from a, an adjacent metro area. We have a widely disaggregated population that, that's still a reflection of that industrial past. And all this is intended to show you these are the largest states by population in the U.S. This is the percent of population that's rural. 34% of North Carolinians are still in rural areas. And I wanted to show you this. The only places called rural are these. So we still have a distinct demographic character, and that means in economic development, if we want to assure the economic well-being of our citizens, our strategies have to take that into account. We have, second to Ohio, the largest number of those micropolitans. We are still Mayberry. We're also high-tech. We're also... You know, we're, we're also urban, but we still are a state of small towns, and we have responsibilities to address that in our economic policy. So the lessons from our success in crowdfunding our own economic destiny over 100 years ago, entrepreneurship and innovation are not something that other people have to teach us how to do. My folks in Chapel Hill will be happy to go out and tell you how to do these things, but we know how to do these things, and we've practiced them well in the past, Secondly, in economic development, while we think of it now as a government function, it should not be a government function. It has not been successful as purely a government function. Private enterprise is how we achieve growth. Now, I, I speak to you from the Keenan Institute of Private Enterprise. <laughs> but that's the simple reality. Regardless of ideology or politics or anything else, economic development as programmatic tools, as use of incentives, can touch no more than a few companies in a state full of hundreds of thousands. You have to instead adopt policies that benefit and facilitate enterprise across the state and across industry and across organizational structure. If you want to do anything to move the needle, it takes scale and scope. It's back to you have to have a statewide effect. And as simple as this, I hear some discussions. We're worried about socialism. We're worried about the bad name that capitalism has in some quarters. Very simple. More capitalism by more capitalism is what we should strive for. More capitalism by more capitalism is how we all get better in economic terms. So I've done quite a bit of work with folks at the legislature and I'm very pleased to see we've had a pivot 
oh, our favorite Chapel Hill terms, a pivot. We have gone from focusing tremendously on targeted interventions, of which we were quite proud, but we celebrated our focus on this industry versus that industry, our use of incentives, et cetera. We pivoted from that to addressing the underlying things that were making it hard to be a business success in North Carolina. What I think of, let's just put it this way, I am not confident can business can help your business. I know we can hurt it. And in many ways, I think our focus on industrial recruitment and economic development turned a blind eye toward the ways we were creating friction that was restraining enterprise across the state. That has begun to be addressed in the legislature in the last few years, and I think with some success. In the last 10 quarters, I've gone from I'm talking about eight financial quarters to 10 financial quarters. After decades of per capita income growth that was slower than the rest of the country, we have had 10 straight quarters where our per capita income outgrew the national average. It outgrew our neighboring states too. Now 10 quarters is 10 quarters, but it's better than eight quarters and maybe it'll be 11 quarters and pretty soon. What we're seeing from the hard decisions that have been made at the legislature to do small things, tax rates, simple regulatory reform, other small things that you don't get to cut ribbons on, you're seeing the kind of incremental benefits that are occurring across the state that you would hope to see when you make those systemic improvements. So higher growth than our neighbors. We're seeing benefits both in metro and non-metro. We're seeing benefits and in growth in income in general, but we still lag in one particular area, and that's in property income, what's known as that's what we call investment income. We are still lagging, where we just say we have remaining untapped opportunities to help our citizens become more successful capitalists and benefit by increasing their income resulting from investment. This is a fun way to show what I just told you. And this only goes back a little bit, but I, I, th these, are, these are small but important gains over past performance. So our income in North Carolina, this is some work we're doing with the legislature right now, if we talk about income, it's too easy to think we're talking about jobs or just wages. Now, obviously, jobs and wages is still the majority of people's income. But pension and property income are also important and need to be growing components. If we want to grow income, we need to grow earnings, and we need to grow in investment returns. So in total income, we've outperformed our neighboring states in the last 10 quarters. But as I said, we've been lagging the U.S. and our neighbors in investment return. So what can we do to increase investment return? Well, this is a new idea in North Carolina. Because we get 6,800 places that the government will sell you gambling. We've got 450 places where the government will sell you liquor. We've got hundreds where we'll sell you a vanity license plate. We will appeal to your vices. But where do we enable people to invest? How are we going to make more and better capitalists? Well, crowdfunding is, a, is at, least a, at least addresses that opportunity. I would say, I wouldn't call it necessary. It's helpful, but it is far from sufficient. But I think it demonstrates the right direction in our political discussion. How do we enable more people to become capitalists? This is a step in that direction. There have been several other proposals, some good, some bad. But I think they demonstrate the political opportunity and perhaps the economic necessity of increasing people's ability to participate in the economy as investors. So that, that generation of in industry we developed in the 19th century, we see examples of them today. In our work with the legislature on the economic development and the use of incentives, there were si some simple characteristics we look for today to maximize economic benefit. We look for companies that are headquartered here who are not growing in a, what unfortunately we too often call distressed or rural areas, despite the disadvantages there, but that they're indeed regional advantages of those locations. Again, they're doing value-added production for export market, and when they have local investors, when they make money, it's shared within the economy. One of the things I have to do quite a bit of is dissuade people that rural North Carolina, one, is all the same. It's not all the same. Two, that it's all in distress. We've had a few generations of policy folks whose job was to talk about poor rural North Carolina, how it needed government help. That has been a very persuasive message, and we've convinced ourselves that that's true. 
But I don't look at North Carolina that way. I look at North Carolina through the population of, of, of growing companies. These are the companies, the high impact companies that are growing across North Carolina. We still have a tremendously fertile seedbed of entrepreneurship and businesses in even some of our most rural counties. And I'll get back to one more comment my hero, Charles Fisher, said that millions of our dollars lie idle in banks earning 4% that might be more profitably and usefully invested in manufacturing. Well, we got $350 billion in North Carolina in deposits, and the best you're going to get on the CD these days is 1.7. I'd love to get 4%. Frankly, frankly, we're, uh, the treasurer's getting ready to sell $200 million of that $2 billion bond issue. How many of you have got a piece of that? What's the interest rate on that going to be? Anybody know here? I don't know. I can't find it. But, you know, I might have wanted to add that to my portfolio. I might have wanted to have the opportunity to invest in all the good things that that bond issue is supposed to produce in North Carolina. We should be looking to our own capital when we look for opportunities, when we see opportunities for investing in North Carolina. Uh, I would like to have, I've got a 401k. This is the last slide, so I may go on. I've got a 401k. Y'all got 401ks. Once a year, we go through the 401k charade. How am I allocating my portfolio this year? I don't know. You don't know. I got an MBA. I don't know. It's harder for me to admit than it is for you. But we get, we have tens and hundreds of billions of dollars in 401ks that if I had the option to invest in North Carolina by just putting a small amount of that in some kind of a structure that would provide me a decent rate of return and that I would feel was benefiting my fellow citizens in North Carolina, I think I would respond favorably to that as well. Now, what I'm arguing for is in economic development, the best way to do that is through private enterprise. The best way to grow income in North Carolina is to make sure that we participate as capitalists in our own economy and that we derive a second income based on investment returns. And that if we're going to ask people to gamble and to buy liquor, if we're going to support vanity, the customized license plates, I think we have a similar obligation to make sure that they have opportunities to participate as capitalists in this economy too. It has worked for us in the past. Uh, I believe it will work for us again in the future, and we welcome the ideas of the community on how we can best accomplish that. Thank you.